بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله أجمعين ثم أما بعد really see that the Torah doesn't need any introduction I don't like to sound cliche but I think we're all aware of who he is and his reputation and the enormous contribution he he has made and continues to make to the service of his team. But I think what's more important is we should think about why we're we're here today and why we're we're listening to him in particular and maybe not somewhere else. And we live in very confusing times, especially for people of faith, of uh, very acrimonious times. Uh, those of you who live here in Egypt probably have been witness to that firsthand, more so in the past few months. And a lot of people ask, you know, who do we follow? How do we know what to follow? How do we know what's true? And, you know, someone who's just talking the talk, but can't really walk the walk and so forth. So, see that the Quran is one of those individuals where you can rest assured that when you're listening to him, that you have entered into that great tradition of of Islam of the Deen. What I mean by that is that we have an inherited uh, tradition. Our tradition, our Deen, how we understand it, is an inherited one. It's no rules. The Prophet Sallallahu he said, we the Prophets, we don't leave behind the Nawad al we don't leave behind gold and silver. But their if or their inheritance are the teachings that they left behind. Sure. So the teachings that uh, they left behind, that's the inheritance, the true inheritance. And to avail yourself of that true inheritance, you have to seek an inheritor. So by seeking out the inheritor, the one who has inherited that tradition, then you can be more confident and then you can be more assured <coughs> of that which you're learning is something that is, lies within the realm of the tradition of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu And anyone who, many of you are studying it at Azhar, from I understand, in this room and, and other places, you sure, most surely have heard the famous saying of the ulama where they said that Islam min al that Islam is from the deen, namely that this train of transmission, this inherited tradition is from amongst the deen. And our greatest ulama have said this as well, the Imam Malik has recorded have said, inna hadha al-amr al-deen, fanzuru mimman ta'khuduna deenakum. This matter of ours, in other words, this learning, it's, it's part of our faith, of our deen. So look to whom you are taking your deen from. And Imam Malik was one of those people who was renowned for this, and that he would even not listen to certain hadith narrators based upon some small, you know, contravention of etiquette that he thought happened on their part. And so I think we have to remind ourselves constantly of this because of all of the people who like to talk about religion nowadays and talk about it quite loudly and you're not sure, is this the real thing, so we're following this, you know, they call themselves shaykh, but they're disparaging this group and disparaging that person, and they're calling this person kafir and this person corrupt, and, and so forth. So, in an age where it's becoming increasingly difficult, and it actually it's an age that's been prophesized by our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and that there will come a time when uh, knowledge will be lifted from this ummah, and it will not be lifted by being plucked out, but rather by qabdil <coughs> ulama. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take the souls of those ulama until it will become less and less, and then there will be people who will be taken as leaders as their ulama, but they are misguided, and they are misguiding. So it's a real ni'mah, it's a real blessing to have the Allah Khuruq Abdullah here with us this week, and I guarantee you, there's nothing more important this week that you should be doing than coming here and listening to him. If you're a surgeon and you have to do a heart transplant, I would say delay it. It's more important that you come here and listen to Dr. Allah and see and hear what he has to say about the foundations of this deed. <coughs> so, uh, first, uh, I congratulate all of you that uh, Alhamdulillah is one of the numbers I think that we expected. There are much more. 
So that's a beautiful thing, and hopefully it will increase. And we ask Allah SWT to increase us in faith and iman, and in respect for our great ulama, because the more respect we have for them, then the more that we can benefit uh, from them. So بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم افتح علينا بحكمتك وانشر علينا برحمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام اللهم صل وسلم بارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله عدد كمال الله كما يليق بكماله يا عليم علمنا من علمك ما ترضى به عنا ولا تؤاخذنا بما تعلمه منا يا حليم خلقنا بخلق الحلم وحققنا بحقائق العلم سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم We are beginning tonight a poem on the creed and this is a short poem of 19 verses we hope to be able to go through the poem thoroughly over the next week ta'ala. the name of the poem is Aqidatun Najah and it was written by Shaykh Muhammad ibn Ja'far al-Kattani you have a short description of him here in your printout his name is Muhammad ibn Ja'far al-Kattani al-Hassani al-Fasi. He lived from 1857 to 1927. He lived for 70 years. He was a great scholar of the 18th and 19th century, one of the luminaries of Islam in the modern time. He was known as a historian. He was a muhaddith and he wrote in hadith. Uh, he was also a prolific author who wrote about many things. He was born in Fez and he lived and taught there for most of his life. Then in 1913, just before the outbreak of World War I, he went to Medina in the Hijaz and he stayed there for the next six years. It was during that time that he wrote this poem. And when he was in Medina, he met a great Egyptian Sheikh, whose name was Sheikh, Sheikh Muhammad Ahmed al Dandarawi. And Sheikh Muhammad Ahmed al Dandarawi um, was a great, powerful man. He did wonderful things in his life. But uh, Sheikh al Kattani followed him in Medina. And uh, one of the things that Sheikh uh, al Dandarawi asked of him is that he write the most basic creed that he could write, that could be used in teaching children and busy adults. So he wrote this poem. It's 19 verses and he tries to put in it just the most essential aspects of the Islamic creed. Um, in 1920 he left Medina and he went to Damascus. He lived there for a number of years and then in 1927 he returned to Morocco where he died and where he's buried. May Allah have mercy upon him. So we want to look at this poem and uh, he begins of course with the basmala because that's a sunnah as all of you know and because of the fact that it also is the key of baraka. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the name of God, the uh, universally merciful the uh, specifically merciful. And um, we begin with that name uh, with the intention to study this poem and to learn it. We ask Allah to give us tawfiq in that. Um, one of the things that I would like to note here uh, in speaking about the Basmala is uh, to talk a little bit about the name of God. So in Islam, we use, of course, the great name of God, Allah. 
And uh, this is a name which is ancient and which is profound and which is the greatest name of God. And as Muslims, we have a natural inclination, even if we speak in English or French or German or Spanish, to use the word Allah. So it's good here to talk about that name a little bit and then also to talk about words like God in English or Dieu in French and in other European languages. Um, the word Allah is the great name of God and uh, it is also the name of God which uh, has cognates in the biblical languages. So the most common name for God in the Hebrew Bible is Ha-Eloh and also Elohim. And the Hebrew Eloh is identical to the Arabic Ilah. And in Aramaic, which is probably the language of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, in fact, we don't know for sure what language Jesus taught in. Um, we presume that it was Aramaic because of the fact that Aramaic was the dominant language of Palestine in his time. And it was the common language of the Hebrews who were there in that time. But the fact is that we do not know exactly whether Jesus taught in Hebrew, the language of Moses, whether he taught in Aramaic, the language of the post-Babylonian captivity, or whether he taught perhaps in Greek, because Greek was the official language of the Eastern Roman Empire. And Egypt at that time, and Palestine, they were under Greek speakers. So it is conceivable that he spoke in Greek. This tells us something about the history of Christianity. And that is the fact that the message of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was virtually lost completely. If we do not know what language he spoke, then it means also that we do not have any original text that goes back to him. If we had an original text that we could say is what Jesus actually gave us, then of course it wouldn't be difficult to identify the language and to know that it is Syriac or Aramaic or Hebrew or whatever it may have been. Jesus probably spoke in Aramaic and the Semitic language that occurs in the Gospels that we have today uh, is in Aramaic. So we can assume that. In Aramaic, the word for God is Allah. Allah. And the word for the God is Allah. Allah. So these words, Allah in Arabic, Elohim or Ha Eloh in Hebrew and Allah in Aramaic, they're all cognates. They are all virtually identical to each other linguistically. The differences that are there in their pronunciation are because of the different ways that those language, languages evolved over history. And one of the things that um, we can note here is that of these three languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Arabic, Arabic is the most ancient of them all. Even though historically, Arabic is the last of them to be written. But in terms of the language itself, the structure, the content, the sound system of the Arabic language, it is the oldest of all the Semitic and Hamitic languages. Even if we take the language that Pharaoh spoke in Egypt 5,500 years ago, it is not as old as Arabic, and it belongs to the same family. So that Pharaoh, for example, if he talks about the crocodile, he'll call it Mesah, Mesah, 
which is the same root that you get timsah from. Okay, so Egyptian is a language, ancient Egyptian, that is between the Semitic family of Arabia and between the family of Berber and of the different uh, languages of North Africa. It's in between that. Yet Arabic is much older than all of those. Arabic, and this is because of the fact that Arabic was preserved by the Arabian Peninsula. That would be a beautiful lecture, and I'd be happy to talk about it at some other time. The, the, the signs of Allah in the creation of the world and in the creation of the Arabian Peninsula. The Arabian Peninsula was the protected sanctuary where the uh, speakers of Arabic developed thousands of years ago and where they were protected from any kind of outside influence that would, like conquest, um, that would change their language. And then also God instituted in Arabia about uh, 3,600 years ago the pilgrimage. He renewed it. And this pilgrimage, it also protects the tribes and the sacred months. So Arabic is a very special language. How do we know that? We know that from comparative linguistics. So we take all the family, Hebrew, Aramaic, Thamudic, Ethiopic, Babylonian, Egyptian, Berber, Coptic, Coptic is also close to Pharaonic Egyptian. We take all of those languages and we study them comparatively. And we see what do they have in common. And then on the basis of that, we say that the original tongue that these came from, it must have had certain characteristics. And in the, in the case of Arabic and the Semitic languages, if a language has two-thirds of those original characteristics, we say it's ancient. So we would say that Egyptian, Pharaonic Egyptian, is ancient because it has two-thirds of the qualities. But it lost many things. But those qualities are things like tenuin, rajulun, rajulan, rajulin, things like i'rab, ar-rajulu, ar-rajula, ar-rajuli, things like the dual, ar-rajulani, wa ra'aytu ar-rajulaini, wa yani uh, yaktubani, wa lam yaktuba. And then you have all you have the difference between sad and dad and between tha and seen. Okay, these, when you have those, these are characteristics of ancient, ancient Arabic, uh, Semitic and Hamitic. And Arabic has all of them. It has every single one of them. There's only one feature that is disputed. So Arabic is an ancient, ancient language. And the way that Arabic was spoken in the Arabian pen pen Peninsula at the time of the birth of the Blessed Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, this language was probably spoken that way at least 10,000 years before that. Based on comparative linguistics. Based on very sound study of comparative linguistics. So we need to know that because Arabic is an ancient, ancient tongue. And all of the family of Semitic and Hamitic languages all of the members of that family are very rich. The Egyptians love their language, for example. And the Egyptians, their language is very similar to Arabic. And, for example, the meanings of the words in ancient Egyptian, they come out of the letters. And then the construction of those letters makes the meaning. This is the way Arabic is, right? But Egyptian was that way too. And that's why the Egyptians never wanted to leave Egyptian to use Greek, for example. And even when the cult of Isis went to Rome and the Romans wanted to translate the cult of Isis and its different texts into Greeks, Greek, the Egyptians didn't want that because they said there's secrets in these words and the words have to be kept the way they are. 
So Arabic is very ancient and very pure and very rich, and it is a language that was created in order to embody prophecy and in order to receive the revelation of the Qur'an in the most perfect way. So when we talk about Allah, then this is an ancient, ancient word, and our grammarians differ about whether it is derivative or not. We won't go into that. But the root, Aliha, that it comes from, the Hamza, the Lam, and the Ha, it has a number of meanings, but the most basic is Abada. So Al Ilah is Al Ma'bud, just as Al Kitab is Al Maktub. So the form Ilah, Fi'al, Kitab, it can mean Maf'ul. And Ilah is Al Ma'bud. Our scholars used to say, usually say that Allah is Al Ma'budu bi Haq. Hu Al Ma'budu bi Haq. Okay, and this is a great name. And we love the word Allah. We use the word Allah. But especially when we're talking about English and we're talking about French and German and other languages, what about their words for God? And here, you know, one of our most important Islamic beliefs is the fact that all human beings know God through fitrah. God is not an unknown. God is deeply embedded. The knowledge of God is deeply embedded in your heart. And also creation shows us that God exists. And also human beings are recipients of revelation. The revelation may be lost, it may be altered, but nevertheless remnants of it there remain. So, therefore, people, as a rule, have words for God that are very old and remarkably valid and effective. The word God in English is one of those words. And the word God, or in German you have Gott, which is cognate to God, just like Elah is cognate to Elah. The word God in English is an old word, thousands of years old. And in terms of Indo-European linguistics, which is very carefully studied, the word God originally means he who is supplicated. He who is supplicated. And um, it's amazing because of the fact that the word God in English, or Gott in German, is so close in meaning to the word Allah. Allah is Al-Ma'bud. Al-Ma'bud bi-Haq. And God is al madru he is the one who's called upon. And uh, so the words are very close. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Dua Mukhul Ibadah, that dua is the essence of worship. So um, we should not feel that it is wrong to use the word God. And in the Latin languages of Europe, the Romance languages of Europe, you have words like Dieu in French, and you have like uh, Dios in Spanish, and Dio in Italian. And these words go back to another Indo-European root. And that Indo-European root is the root for light. So the ancient meaning of Dieu or Deus Dios is a nur, which is also one of the many beautiful names of God. So it's important that when we speak in French and we speak in English, that we do not feel that it is improper to use these words, that somehow we are compromising what we are saying if we use those words. 
It's as if that were to, that's as if to say that human beings can talk about mountains, they can talk about the sky, they can talk about trees, but they can't talk about the most fundamental reality of all, which they know in their hearts, and that is the existence of God. Um, this would never have been an issue maybe a hundred years ago. And when Muslims first go to England and to Germany and to France and they begin to use these languages, they, to my knowledge, had no reservations about the validity of using words like God or using words like Dieu. But the um, ideologies of Islam that developed in the course of the 20th century in particular, um, they often took positions that uh, changed the way that we look at things. And a lot of times these Islamic ideologies were counter-cultural. In other words, whereas Islam historically is never counter-cultural. Islam historically was a religion that had the, the ability uh, as a conquering religion and as a world religion that spread through trade and other means to engage the civilizations of the world and to bring them under a common rubric of understanding. This is very typical of Islam for over a thousand years. And uh, it's a very important feature. So we were never countercultural. In other words, we were people who were able to look at different cultures and to accept everything that was good in them and to build on that foundation and then to make from that a new world that has in it the best elements of Persia and of the Greeks and of the Romans and of the Visigoths and of the rabbis, and of the Buddhists. Our, our madrasa system very much comes out of a Buddhist cultural milieu. But we take good wherever we find it, and then we're able to build this beautiful civilization. Okay, but in the modern ages, a lot of times Muslims have been countercultural, which perhaps reflects the fact that there is often a sense of inferiority and of deficiency in us. And therefore it's like, we believe in God, we believe in Allah, we have the truth, but you people don't have anything. And for that reason, even to this day, sometimes if you'll use, in speaking in a khutbah, in English, use the word God, people will come up and object. Like, how can you use this word? So this is not sound. And we have to understand that God sent prophets to all people and all people, with very few exceptions, have beautiful names of God, often that probably go back to the prophetic legacy. In the English language, we have in Old English, which is the language that was spoken in the days of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it's a beautiful language. And in Anglo-Saxon, Old English, we have over 30 names of God. Beautiful names of God. Which, and, which are names of Tawheed. Okay, so this is part of a legacy. God is one of the greatest of those. Okay, but there are also other, other words, you know. Uh, okay, so um, we want to make that point. In the 20th century, one of the great scholars and the great anthropologist of the 20th century was a German named Wilhelm Schmidt. And Wilhelm Schmidt wrote a very long work on the primitive religions. His work is maybe 10 volumes long. I forget how long it is. It's a really, really useful work. He spent his life writing that. He wrote about the primitive religions. Now, the primitive religions are the religions of isolated peoples around the world. And we talked about cognitive frames in the introduction 
before this class, but primitive is a cognitive frame. And primitive is a Darwinian cognitive frame. Literally, the word primitive means what? First. So if something is primitive, it means that you're going back to the prime or the primal state. But because of Darwinian theology, we also believe that primitive means backwards. Yeah, that's not true. This is a cognitive frame. It is not a historical fact. And these are things that need to be studied carefully. Okay, now primitive peoples, they don't live 3,000 years ago or 5,000. They live right now, you know, in 2013, except that they're in Micronesia or they're in the Kalahari or they're in uh, northern, northern Japan or other places. And the actual reality of primitive people is that they are kinship societies. They are societies that don't have government and they don't have a history of kingship and of classes and things that you have in like civilized society. But they are little people, they're micro societies that usually live isolated, far away, uh, maybe in Borneo, and everybody is related. And the governance of the society is controlled by kinship. Who is the grandfather? You know, who is the uncle? Okay, so he did a study of these micro-religions. And we can assume that these religions, if they have things in common, are telling us something about a historical truth because they've been separate for so long. Okay, not because of the fact that they are actually perfectly mirroring the way they lived 5,000 years ago. We don't know that. We can only assume that. But one of the things that Schmidt shows is that all primitive religions, all micro-religions believe in the one God. And they all have very beautiful words for calling upon him. Words that speak of his oneness, words that speak of his pre-existence, words that speak of his mercy. And Wilhelm Schmidt concludes on that basis that there must have been an ancient prophecy that took in these people and other peoples of the world. Okay, but this is a very important point. And again, it is contrary to what anthropologists often believed in the 20th century because of the fact that there were certain anthropologists like one named Taylor who believed that primitive religions didn't even know God. That they don't even have religion and they begin to develop religion by believing in spirits and believing that spirits are in trees or spirits are in animals and things like that. So Wilhelm Schmidt showed that's not true at all. And he showed that polytheism such as you had in ancient Egypt or ancient Babylon, is essentially the product of politics and religion and conquest. And the way that pantheons that were originally the creator gods are made into different gods. That's what happened in Egypt. In Egypt, all of the great gods of the gnomes of Egypt, like Amun and Ra and Ptah, they were all creator gods. They were all names for the same god. Ra is like the Vahir. Ra is also the sun in the midday. But it is like the Arabic word Al. He is the high. In fact, the word Ra in, he, in Egyptian relates to the Arabic Al. Okay? And Amun is like al Batin. And Patah is al Fatah. Patah. Patah in ancient Egypt is Fatah. Okay, but when these are put together, then you get a pantheon, where you keep this name, but now you give this name a new identity. And um, the ancient Greeks used to say, one tribe, one God. 
that wherever you find one tribe, which today we might call a primitive society, a kinship group that has nothing but kinship, then you will always see they have one God. Okay, so the belief in Tawheed is not something that people invented. It is not something that uh, develops in history. It's not something that we owe to the Jews. You know, the, the Hebrews were given great prophets and they were tested by that. But even in their own books, Tawheed is much older than that. It is something that is intrinsic in us. And the point that I'd like to make is that do not feel in speaking English or French, that you cannot use the word God. The word God is the most beautiful word in the English language. And do not feel when you're speaking French that you can't use the word Dieu or Gott when you use German. Uh, I wrote an article about that called One God, Many Names, which you can find on the internet if you like. And uh, you could read that if you want further knowledge. But... I think this is a very important point. Again, I'm not saying that the word God is equal to Allah. Or that instead of saying Allahu Akbar, we can say God is great or God is greater. Uh, the word Allah has very special properties that are uniquely its own. I do not regard any name for God to be equal to it. But nevertheless, when we speak English, it is valid to use words like God. And it's also important to do that because, first of all, it respects the people we speak to. And, you know, it also communicates to them. And because of the problematic history of Islam in the West, often our own beautiful word for God, Allah, has been uh, so demeaned in the minds of non-Muslims that you can't use it and get the right response. When I say to you the word Allah, you know, the word Allah puts off in your mind and your heart a whole series of beautiful associations. Okay, but for a lot of Westerners that would never be the case at all. When you say Allah, or however they mispronounce it, you know, then immediately something happens. It's like, it's foreign, it's strange. In fact, many of them, and this is the way that I was brought up as a Christian, you know, they even believe that Allah is not God. We were taught that in Sunday school. You know, that Allah is another God, which is a gross distortion of the Bible and a gross distortion of history. But when you put that into people's minds, it's very hard to get it out. And to expect that you can tell your audience that, you know, I don't want to use the word God, I'm going to use, use the word Allah, you must know that they mean the same. It's like, what? If they mean the same, why don't you use the, use the word God? And if they don't mean the same, why? And what is, in, what is deficient about the word that I use? So uh, it respects the people. And then also it communicates. Because the words that I know and have used for all my life they immediately speak to me. Whereas other words that I have learned, they never will quite do it the same way. And for many people who embrace Islam, the, especially people who come from a background like mine, uh, the word Allah has to be, um, it has to be rehabilitated. You have to lift it up and put it in the right place so that it begins to have the cognitive response in your heart that it should have. Okay, so we have to keep these in mind. And we do not want to present ourselves in speaking to the West as a counterculture that denies anything good that they have, especially the treasury of the name of God. And also we, uh, you know, do not want to make theological mistakes. Like, if we believe that other people cannot talk about God, that is a very serious error from the standpoint of Islamic theology. Okay, so, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Aqidatul Najah, the creed of salvation. He calls this creed by that name because it is his, it is his endeavor, it is his hope. Uh, that in giving you this poem, if you learn it, 
and understand it, that this is all that you need for your salvation in the next world. So he calls it aqidatul najah. If you know this, it is enough for your najah. We hope that this is the case. Okay, so he begins there with verse 1. قال محمد هو ابن جعفر لقب كتان عليه قد جرى قال محمد هو ابن جعفر لقب كتان عليه قد جرى so he says muhammad said son the son of jafar widely known by a name from selling linen or the name of the linen seller Okay, so this is the first verse. It's a very short poem, and he begins by speaking about himself. He does that because of the fact that it is part of our tradition. It is part of our tradition because, as Sheikh Walid said, our tradition is a tradition of authority. And it is a tradition where when we speak about the Prophet وسلم, and the legacy of the Prophet and Islam, uh, we have to do that on the basis of authority, not just personal ideas. Okay? So therefore, we have to know who is the author of the poem? Who is the author of the book? And is he or she worthy of writing this kind of thing? Is he a journalist? Is he just a historian? Um, is he a person who took it upon himself to just learn this from scratch? What authorization does he have? So, a deen ilm, this religion is knowledge. Uh, you know, so we have to consider whom we take that knowledge from. And Muhammad ibn Ja'far al-Kattani is one of the truly great scholars of the 19th and 20th century. And you know who he is. Um, if you have doubts about him, then that's your own business. You can study his life, you can read the things that he's written, but you have to know who he is. And he is a person who is worthy of teaching this. He is a person who knows the tradition and who can also summarize the tradition which is what he was asked to do. Okay, so that's why he begins by telling you who he is. Uh, not because of the fact that he's proud and because he wants you to make sure that you know that this is his poem, but because of the fact that the teacher must first identify himself or herself. And you must know that they are worthy of teaching this science. And then also we have to know that what is transmitted here has come to us authentically. Okay, this is very important. So that's why he begins with that. قَالَ مُحَمَّدٌ هُوَ بْنُ جَعْفَرَ لَقَبُ كَتَّانٍ عَلَيْهِ قَدْ جَرَى As Shaykh Walid noted in the introduction, uh, one of the major problems that Muslims face today and they have faced now for many decades, is the question of authority. That who has the authority to speak? And in the time that we live in today, there are many voices, and there are many different points of view, and there are many conflicting interpretations. This, in the, in the mind of certain historians, is the crisis of authority. And this is a crisis that is, re is essentially a colonial and post-colonial phenomenon. Even though the roots of it may go back before that. You know, as Sheikh Walid was mentioning to me yesterday, one of the things that Muhammad Ali did in Egypt was to undercut the authority of the ulama. And to my knowledge, he's probably one of the first people to do that. He took away the Al-Qaf, for example. This is a major way that the authority of the ulama and their universities, their libraries and their schools, which were very strong and that flourished in the past, were undercut. 
And then also you have things like the development of the printing press. And we don't say that the printing press is not a good thing. All things that enable us to communicate, many of the people who have honored us by coming here tonight, you only knew that we were here because of the internet and because of that social networking that the internet allows us to do. So we live in a time when information is easily available, but also it's a time in which everyone can speak. And um, some people speak with authority, some people speak with uh, authorization, some speak, people speak with understanding, which maybe they've gathered after years and years of study with very highly qualified people. And then you have other people that really they just have ideas or they have ideologies. Okay, so this is a really important thing. And one of the most important objectives for Muslims over the next century or more is the objective to try to re-establish sound authority and to be able to um, make clear to Muslims who speaks in the name of this religion, who has the right to interpret, you know, what does this religion teach, what does it not teach, where does it stand. And today we see forms of Islam that are presented that are not like anything that we knew in the past, you know, and we have terrorism that is done in the name of our religion. We have the destruction of historical legacies that was never done in the past. So these are very, very crucial questions. You know, who speaks about this religion? Who teaches this religion? So he begins with that, that I am this person and I speak uh, with authorization in, in this poem, Bi'ithni Lahi Ta'ala. Then he says after that, Hamdan liman awjadana min al-adam wa khassana bi khayri man lahu al-qadam. So this is the iftitah, you know, this is the istihlal, this is the uh, metaphorical beginning of the poem in which he wants to tell us in a nutshell what the poem is about. So here you have two fundamental aspects of the creed. You have the belief in God, which we call ilahiyat, uluhiyat. We have the, the divinity, hamdan liman aw jadana min al-adam. And then you have prophecy, wa khassana bi khayri man lahu al-qadam. These are the two fundamental bedrocks of traditional Islamic theology. And of course they represent La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. And then there is a third part of theology which we call traditionally the Sam'iyat, which means the things that are transmitted, the things that have been heard from the Prophets. If you look through this poem, you will see that it's one of the things which he doesn't talk about. And in teaching the poem, we will talk about that. But if you believe in the Prophet, and you believe that the Prophet was Amin and Sadiq and Muballir, you know, then of course everything that authentically is transmitted from him is also Siddiq. And it's also Balaq and it also must be believed. So again, he's going to cut this down to the very, very most essential basics. So he begins by saying that qala Muhammadun hamdan. In other words, like this poem that I'm giving you, um, although it is um, an educational poem to teach you, uh, will be an act of worship. This poem and everything coming out of it is an act of hamd, that we say this out of praise of God, that you know, it is not our purpose just to study about God, it is not our purpose just to learn the fundamentals about God, but in doing this it is our intent to praise Him by that knowledge. 
So he begins Hamdan. And therefore, in taking this poem from him, uh, also it becomes the Ithni Lahi Ta'ala, an act of worship for us. Because the reason why we learn about God is so that we know him and so that we can identify this creation as his world that he made and so that we can draw closer to him bi izni lahi ta'ala so he says hamdan liman awjadana min al adam out of praise of god who gave us existence from non existence okay this is a theological position and of the many theological positions that are there and that he could have put in this place, he chooses this one as the most important of all. That of all things that you believe, one of those that you must never forget and you must call to mind is that this world is the creation of God and it is not eternal. This world has a beginning and it was given existence from sheer non-existence. So we want to talk about that this evening, bi-idhni lahi ta'ala, and uh, we'll build on that in the days to come, insha'Allah ta'ala. But this is a very important Islamic belief. And it is also, as a matter of historical fact, a issue of consensus between the ancient Jews, the ancient Christians, and the Muslims. That God created this world from nothing. Kun fayakun. He says to it, be, and it is. And that everything in this world, as real as it is, as tangible as it is, is a veil of power. The rock, the sun, the sea, the animals, the birds, all of these beautiful things that exist, they are in reality manifestations of the sheer power of God, the creative will of God, and the infinite knowledge of God that underlies that. Because this is a very important belief. And this is a belief that itself removes a thousand veils from the heart. Okay, so we should always keep that in mind, you know, and we have to understand this, inshallah, tonight we will try to talk about it in a way that is meaningful, bi-idhni lahi ta'ala. Hamdan liman awjadana min al-adam. So he says this out of praise for God who gave us existence from non-existence and gave us special distinction through our Prophet, the best of those having preeminence. وَخَصَّنَا بِخَيْرِ مَنْ لَهُ الْقَدَمْ Here the word qadam uh, means preeminence. It means that which goes before everything else. Uh, also we have al-qadam, you know, uh, which we use for the foot and which is in Arabic muannif, right? هَذِهِ قَدَمٌ or هَذِهِ قَدَمُ fulan. But uh, the word foot um, as Qadam is also called that because it is what goes first. That when you walk, you put your foot before you, and then you come after, then you put the other foot in front of you. So the word Qadam also is because of the fact that it goes first. That's why it's called that. But here the word Qadam is preeminence, and this is a very important Islamic belief that there are people of preeminence. Who are they? They are the messengers and the prophets. You know, they are the greatest of all human beings and they are among the greatest of all creation and the greatest of those is the last of them, the final prophet, the prophet who is called in the Bible the prophet of the end of days, the Deuteronomy prophet of 1818, you know, which is a very fundamental Biblical, ancient Jewish and Christian belief that God will send a prophet in the end of time who is like Moses and he will be from the vicinity of your brothers, not of you. He will be 
uh, he will be of min kareb, he will be of the vicinity of your brothers or your brother. Very, very interesting verse in the Bible. And the Bible still has verses like that in it and in the Dead Sea Scrolls community that existed in Qumran, in Palestine, um, in the decades before Jesus Christ, the Dead Sea Scrolls are extremely important. Uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls community was one that believed that the coming of the Messiah was close and it believed that after the Messiah would come the great prophet of the end of time. And they believed in both and they were there to accept both and to support both of them. So this is also part of our belief and inshallah in the days ahead we will come to talk about that. So this is an introduction. Hamdan liman awjadana min al adam. So this is a very important belief and it is where in this poem we start. And here we need to talk about a few definitions and a few terms and then we will come to talk about the issue itself which is the issue of creation from, from nothing. Uh, first of all, uh, in Islam one of the distinctive characteristics of our religion is exactitude in definition. The ancient Greeks say that if you get the definitions right you'll get everything else right. The ancient Greeks said that the beginning of knowledge is in definition. Again, um, one of the great defects of modern thought is the fact that we don't always define. And in fact, often we're not able to define. And for that reason, a lot of the concepts that we have <clears throat> are open-ended cognitive frames that lead us to places that we don't know. Westerners feel very comfortable, for example, in talking about nature. Okay, but what is nature? You know, when we say that the trees are the way they are, the birds are the way they are, the animals are in the hierarchies that they're in because of nature, it's like, what is nature? You have to define it. Is nature a person? Is it a power? Is it pre-existent? Is it self-existent? You know, does it command? Does it have will? Does it have power? Is it just an idea? What is it? And in fact, in most Western usage of the word nature, it is a word that is used instead of God. Because to talk about the world as being random chance is not acceptable to any living intellect. So instead we have another word we use which is nature, which is really no better than to use the algebraic symbol X, the unknown. Okay, so we have to define words. Uh, one of the things that we hear a lot as Muslims today, is that Muslims have to learn how to live in modernity or that we have a problem with modernity. Okay, maybe that's true, but what is modernity? Okay, before you tell me that I have a problem with anything, what is modernity? What do you mean by this word? In other words, do you mean by this that I don't have your values? Because if that's the case, then let's talk about it in those terms, you know. But modernity is a really complex idea. And so, again, in light of our tradition, we want to always define, you know, and then we can talk. This is why in Islam we refer to definitions as what? Mustalahat, right? As istilah. And the word istilah is really beautiful because it comes from sulh. It's like we made peace, right? You're saying that you don't know anything about modernity and you don't have any competence in working with modernity and I say that I do. But like, what do I mean when I say that word? And what do you mean? Okay, so let's look at that. And now we have peace. And now we can talk. 
Okay, so it's really, really important. I mean, what is modernity? Is it an economic system? Is it a financial system? Is it types of money? And any kind of valid definition of modernity has got to be economic, in my view. And then we can talk about politics, and we can talk about political systems, and we can talk about ideas, and we can talk about the convulsions that Western civilization has been through, especially in the late 19th and 20th century, because they could never come to terms with modernity. Not as an economic system, you know, with political and economic ramifications. Okay, now we're talking about something which is, I believe, much more meaningful. So in Islam, we always want to get the definitions right. What do these words mean? And here, in this first verse, one of the words that we need to talk about is world. Al-alam. Uh, the word is not there, but it's implied. Hamdan liman awjadana. Praise be to God who created us and everything else from non-existence. So in Islam, we often begin our theology or we talk at a very, very early stage in our theology about the world, the world. And in Arabic, as you know, we call that al-alam, al-alam. So how do we define al-alam? And we say that al-alam ma siwallah, that the world is everything other than God. The world is everything other than God. The world is what I can see and touch and taste and smell and hear. And the world is also many, many things that I cannot see or hear or touch or taste or smell. The world includes everything from the greatest things in creation to the smallest things in creation. Everything from the atom to the galaxy and everything beyond the galaxy in other galaxies and even other worlds if they exist, it's possible. Okay, that is sheer, merely the function of the will of God. But even if there is a parallel universe or a third or fourth or fifth parallel universe, which is possible. All of those are one world. And all of those are that which is other than God. These are things that we will talk about in more detail, inshallah, in the days ahead. They're very, very important. And again, you see in the word alam, the great beauty of the Arabic language because of the fact that the word alam, which comes from the root of knowledge, of the ilm, it is a world that if we contemplate it, it opens the doors of knowledge, it is a source of knowledge, but it is also a source of knowledge because of the fact that it is an alama, it is a sign. And everything in the world, from the smallest to the largest, is a standing banner that points to the fact that it is created and that it has a maker. So everything in the world is a sign of God also. Everything in the world is an ayah. It is a sign. It is an alama. And uh, he is Rabbul Alameen, among the most Beautiful words of praise are those opening words of Al-Fatiha. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Praise be to God, the Lord of all the worlds. Okay, the world of the angels, the world of the jinn, the world of human beings, the world of stars, the world of galaxies, the world of atoms, the world of molecules, of birds, of fishes, of everything. Okay, and one of the things that the creed does to us, bi'ithnillahi ta'ala, is it helps us to open our eyes. And the more that we are able to open our eyes, and the more that we're able to see how this world is a sign of God, you know, the more that you see how marvelous it is. And this is one of the chief purposes of our theology 
to wake us up, to enable us to think, to enable us to see bi idhnillahi ta'ala. So we believe then in the alam, the world, and the world is everything other than God. Ma siwallahi ta'ala. And we believe that the world and every part of everything that is in the world is hadith. So this is another word which is implied here and not used. And the word hadith in Arabic means, uh, or the word huduth, temporality, it means al-wujudu ba'd al-adam. So the definition of this is al-wujudu ba'd al-adam. Al-huduth, we can translate in English as temporality. Uh, our word temporality means in time. Temporality is the quality of being located in time. And usually we understand in Western languages that anything in time is also in space. Okay? So time and space, the world of time and space. But in Arabic we use the word hudus, which comes from a root meaning to occur, to happen. And we define hudus as al-wujudu ba'd al-adam, as existence after non-existence. Al-hadith is that which exists after not having existed. And this we believe to be the trait of the world and of everything in the world. Okay, that it is given existence. That at one time in the past it did not exist and then it was given existence and it began to exist. Okay, so this is a very important belief. And um, here we rely on revelation that God is the creator, he is the originator of creator of creation, he is the one who says to a thing, be and it is, he creates by will, and so forth, and also um yeah, and he, uh, كَانَ اللَّهُ um, وَمَا كَانَ مَعْهُ شَيْءٍ كَانَ اللَّهُ uh, what, How's the hadith? وَلَا شَيْءَ مَعْهُ كَانَ اللَّهُ وَلَا شَيْءَ مَعْهُ So God existed and there was with him nothing. Okay? This is an authentic tradition of our Prophet. God existed and there was with him nothing. There was no primeval matter there was no primeval energy, there was nothing. He existed and nothing existed with him. As we said before, this belief, that كَانَ اللَّهُ وَلَا شَيْءَ مَعَهُ is a matter of ijma', of consensus of the prophets, the messengers, of the ancient Jews, and of the ancient Christians. And it is also the basic position of Ahlus Sunnah wal Jama'ah that God created the world from nothing. Okay? Then also we can look at experience, we can look at science. One of the great things about science, customary experience in modern times, is that Western scientists have done a lot of work. And if you study about them, you find amazing men and women who devoted themselves to the study of their disciplines in a way that is sometimes beyond conception. And in their study of modern science, they have often brought us to the brink of metaphysical truth. Um, we'll give some examples of that tonight. Uh, one of the first of these is the laws of thermodynamics. And the laws of thermodynamics uh, were understood even in the Renaissance, even shortly after the Renaissance. Sir Isaac Newton, the, the actual positing of the laws of thermodynamics is part of 19th century science. Okay, that these are worked out as the first, second, and third laws of thermodynamics as perhaps the most uh, sweeping 
of all statements to be made about physical reality. Okay, but this was well known to Isaac Newton. It's just that he didn't posit a second law of thermodynamics. And Sir Isaac Newton, who believed that God was one, and he was a Unitarian, he believed that thermodynamics, the behavior of heat, gases, and electricity in this world, is a proof of the existence of God. Okay, so the second law of thermodynamics is a law that pertains to the behavior of heat. And then also gases and electricity, they fall under that as well. And the law, the second law of thermodynamics is the law of leveling. The law of leveling. That in the physical world that we see, um, heat and cold will always balance. And that there is a transfer of heat to cold. And it doesn't happen the other way around. Okay? And um, this happens until the fact that you have equilibrium. Okay? So this is a very important pattern in creation. And we regard it on the basis of experience to be irreversible. Okay? So if you have a bathtub of cold water and we take and put a burning hot iron in it, uh, it will sizzle, right, and boil. But after a while, the iron and the water become the same temperature. They level out. And this is something we know very well in our lives. And it's an extremely important law because of the fact that it has so many ramifications. You know, for example, it is according to the law of thermodynamics that uh, we see that oxygen in this room is basically well distributed and that we don't have nitrogen over here and we have everything else over here. If things could behave like that, contrary to the law of thermodynamics, then you know, it would be very difficult for us to live. So it's a very important law. And this law, which is enunciated in the 19th century as one of the important laws of modern science, it also is an indication that everything had a beginning. And that this world is not eternal. It is not without beginning. That it's hadith. That it exists after not having existed. And why is that the case? Because we have disequilibrium. We have disequilibrium. We have hot things and cold things. We have volcanoes and we have cold areas of land. We have stars and we have uh, burnt out stars. We have different types of plants and animals. We have energy in the atom. You know, we have all sorts of manifestations of disequilibrium. And if this world were without beginning, and contained within a material, a material universe where there is no creative force that is adding to it, okay, which is the view essentially of the materialist, then everything today would have to be the same. Exactly the same. There wouldn't even be a table. There wouldn't even be a jar. There wouldn't be a star. There wouldn't be ice in a, and then Volcanoes, everything would be the same. There would be uniformity in all material existence. And that's not the case. That's far from being the case. So therefore, this is an indication of the fact that the world has a beginning. And this is empirical evidence that points us you know, to what we believe in. Um, also in the development of modern science in the 20th century, uh, we have great developments in astronomy and in physics. And uh, one of the things that developed in the course of the 20th century was uh, the discovery of something called the Doppler effect. 
the D-O-P-P-L-E-R effect, the Doppler effect. And Doppler uh, looked at the reception of light in the universe and he developed a rule which is um, one of the, the Doppler, I think it's the Doppler law, in which um, any body in the universe that is approaching us appears as a blue shift. Okay, it appears as, as having a blue light and that things that are moving away from us, they appear with a red shift. So, in looking at the universe, we see that the things that are far away are all in the red shift. And that the further away that they are, the faster they are moving away from the center. Okay, so this study of the Doppler effect is what led to, um, you know, the theory of the point universe. That all of these, all parts of the known universe that we see, they are moving away rapidly from a center. And therefore, we can presume based on certain scientific assumptions about the uniformity of this process, that in the beginning that began at a particular point, and then the world expanded at the speed of light, you know, from that point, and it continues to expand to this day. Okay, so this is a very important law, and this is uh, the theory of the expanding universe. And the way that that theory was popularly presented to people was as the Big Bang Theory, which is an attempt to imagine what was that first moment like. And again, I, I don't like the word Big Bang, even though there is evidence of the fact that there was sound, and great sound. But Big Bang is a word that is inseparably linked in our minds with the idea of chaos and of explosion and of something happening that is uncontrolled. And here when we come to the belief in the infinite point where all of this began, you know, just like with the law of thermodynamics, but here it is more tangible. We have touched the door of metaphysical truth. And, you know, uh, if we cannot speak meaningfully about that metaphysical reality, then this is not something that we really can talk about at all. But to assume that this was just a chaotic explosion where the universe just comes out of nothing and expands and that there's no will, there's no knowledge, there's no power, there's no metaphysical reality to that, um, you know, this is not valid. Okay? But this is a theory which takes us back to the beginning. And although we don't know exactly when that beginning was, according to the calculations of um, modern astronomers, they believe that this is about 13.7 billion years ago. That, to me and you, is a very long time ago. But nevertheless, it is a beginning. And it is a beginning in time and space. Um, also, in the development of modern science, one of the basic principles of what we believe about the world is uh, atomic physics. And this also is really amazing. Uh, the belief that material reality as we see it is made up of atoms. And these atoms are infinitesimally small. Okay? Um, in atomic theory, the atom itself essentially is nothing. It has in it a nucleus, which is the center of the atom. And the nucleus is what contains the weight and the density. 
Okay? And then around that you have the orbit of the electron. And the electron or the electrons go around the nucleus 10 billion times in one millionth of a second. You know, in the 92 different types of atoms that we have been able to identify. You have this electron going around the nucleus 10 billion times in one millionth of a second. I mean, so what are we talking about here? You know, that in other words, here again, the analysis of physical reality uh, has brought us to the point of miracle. That this is an amazing thing. And if we were to build a model of the atom, and of course all of you have seen models of the atom that are maybe this big and you have the nucleus and you have the electrons. That is not an accurate model. The accurate model of the atom would be if, for example, we make the nucleus the size of a fist, then we will make the electron, the orbit of the electron, two football fields. I mean, it's huge. And yet this point, this electron, which, you know, is there in the orbit, even in that model, is just a dot. You know, that is going around the nucleus 10 billion times in one millionth of a second. So here, you know, we see in the construction of the atom that really it's like we're talking about nothing. You know, if we had two football fields and we had in it a tennis ball and a dot, you would say that the football fields are empty. There's nothing there. Okay, and it is the fact that that electron is able miraculously to go around the nucleus so rapidly, so many times, in a flash of a second. This is what gives matter its appearance of being hard and dense. Okay, so these are things to reflect on. And again, you know, the, the existence of the atom from one moment to another moment is miraculous. And everything about this creation is that way, bi'ithnillahi ta'ala. In terms of intellect, um, we also believe that the world is temporal. And in our tradition, it's very important to be able to use the intellect. Uh, some of our scholars talk about the roots of disbelief, Usul al kufr And one of the beliefs of traditional scholars was that inability to understand the intellect is a root of disbelief. It is not disbelief itself. But in order to believe, we must know the necessity of the necessary. We must know the possibility of the possible. And we must know the impossibility of the impossible. This was regarded to be, in traditional Islamic sciences, one of the roots of sound knowledge and one of the roots also of belief. Intellect, as pure reason, has three judgments that it passes on all statements that are made. Okay, intellect will say of a statement that it is necessary, meaning that it must be and that its non-being is inconceivable. For example, one plus one is two. Five is an odd number. Um, in a Euclidean triangle, the sum of the angles of the triangle must be 180. Those are necessary conclusions. Those are necessary relations. Okay, so this is necessary. And then you have the impossible, such as one and one is three, or that four is an odd number, or that in China we have triangles that uh, the sum of their angles is 179 or 178. Okay, you don't have to go to China to study their triangles to see that that's not the case. 
Intellect, pure intellect, does not need repetition. Experience, as a source of knowledge, has to have repetition. And this is also why in defining it we call it al-ada. We call it customary experience because of the fact that in the world of experience there are things that are not customary. Okay? But the things that we study as scientific knowledge, these are the things that repeat themselves. These are the things that have certain patterns that they hold to consistently. Okay, so when we talk about experience, we have to have laboratories, we have to do research, we have to get facts together, we have to see if these things actually cohere or they don't cohere. But in the case of pure reason, pure reason does not work that way. It takes a particular proposition and it is able to say about it by examining the different properties that are in it that this is necessary. That it must be. That one plus one is two. We don't have to take thousands of different items and put them together in units of one and two and see that they're always two. Okay? And then you have that which is impossible. You know, such as a thing that is contained in space and time, like these glasses, they must be in that space and time, either still or moving. Okay? It's got to be one or the other. So this is a necessary proposition about these glasses. And then you have the realm of possibility. And the realm of possibility is infinite. It is infinite multiplied by infinite. And in things that pertain to possibility, then uh, you know, we know that they are the way they are, or they are not the way they are on the basis of revelation, or the basis of experience or something like that, okay? So this is very important. And <clears throat> for um, us, when we talk about the temporality of the world, the fact that the world and everything in it is hadith, it exists after non-existence, um, there are many proofs for that. But one of the proofs that is the most basic is the one of change of change. That things that change must have beginnings. Things that change must have beginnings. And in the Qur'an, Allah Azza wa Jal refers to this world over and over again as the world of change. اِخْتِلَافُ الْلَيْلِ nahar. You have the seasons, you have the day, you have the changes that we witness in ourselves. Change is a manifestation of the fact that the thing is finite. The thing has a beginning. We analyze that in terms of intellect by talking about the attributes of things. So, if I look at these glasses, okay, it is inconceivable for me to conceive of these glasses as existing in time and space, if they don't have certain attributes. Okay, so as a body, it has to occupy a vacuum. Okay, that there's a certain area here that these glasses occupy. They fulfill that. This is what we call it, it has a hayyaz. It occupies a locus. It has a place where it is. And then, it has to have certain attributes of color, of design, of materials that it's made from, and so forth. Okay, so these are secondary attributes, and they are necessary for this thing. Okay, it is not conceivable that this exists as a body, or that this exists as a body, or this microphone if it doesn't have certain attributes that are essential to it. Okay, color, form, weight, materials that it's made from, and so forth. But when we look at these attributes of these things, we know from experience that they change. And we witness them change. We see the glasses move, we see that they are still. 
You know, today maybe the lenses are clean and yesterday they were not. Okay, um, you know, they open easily, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they, they open, uh, you know, with difficulty if the screws are tighter. Okay, so the properties that are necessary to this thing, which we call glasses, and they're all that we perceive, the things that we see, the things that we hear, the things that we touch, the things that we smell, the things that we taste, these are always changing or they are capable of change. And so therefore, this thing itself, it cannot be essentially different from that. It must also be changing and changeable, and just as these things that change, which are its attributes, have beginnings and ends, so this also must have a beginning. Are you able to follow that? It's very, this is intellect. And um, this is a conclusive proof. You know, when we talk about things like thermodynamics, and we talk about the expanding universe, and we talk about the atom, these are the kind of things that we as modern human beings are rightfully amazed by. But they are also things that to us have great weight because of the fact that in our educations we were only given empirical information. So anything that I can talk about, you know, that I can describe and that, you know, we can point to and that uh, can be analyzed by modern science, this is very meaningful to us. But if we look at these theories, like thermodynamics and the expanding universe and atomic theory, uh, actually there are a lot of assumptions that we have to make in order for them to be valid, such as the presumption of the uniformity of nature, things like that. You know, whereas the intellectual proof is conclusive, it is qat'i, and um, it is often very simple and very clear, but you know, it is a very strong proof. So it is the fact that all the things that we see in this world, all of them have secondary attributes. Colors, sounds, movements, stillness, shapes, densities, weights, parts, orders, okay? And all of those things which are their attributes are changing or potentially changing. So therefore, these things themselves, they must be that way. It is not conceivable that they can be infinite without beginning and yet have these finite, limited attributes. Okay, this is very, very important. And, you know, uh, I see certain things made, you know, like... You know, this uh, wonderful little girl gave me this pot, which I think she made herself. You know, you've seen pots made, right? You've seen people take the clay and they shape the clay and they put it on the potter's wheel and then they make the pot. And there it is. It wasn't there before. Okay, so I know that this pot is temporal, that it has a beginning because I actually witnessed it. Okay, but almost everything that we see, we don't and we cannot possibly witness its making. Okay? But because of the necessary relationship between changing attributes, finite attributes that have beginnings, and between the things that they describe as their qualities, then we can judge on that basis that all of this world is temporal. All of this world exists with a beginning. Everything in it, from the mountains to the atoms themselves, you know, to the animals, they all have beginnings. Okay, so this is um, part of the background then for this very important Islamic belief. That we believe that everything in creation is subordinate to the creative power of God. And as part of this belief also, we do not believe in an infinite past that pertains to the created world. We believe in the finitude of the past. The past and future are very different. The future is a potential infinite. 
changing all the time, taking on new characteristics. Kulla yawmin huwa fi sha'n. Okay, but the past must always be specified. It must always be determined. It must always be set. And it cannot extend on its own infinitely into the past. This is also a perception of sound intellect. That you cannot have the vicious circle. The vicious circle is that A makes B and B makes C and C makes, makes A and A makes B. That's the vicious circle. Okay? That's not possible. But to believe that there is a random infinite series of finite changes in the past without a beginning, that is the same as the vicious circle. And it also is a logical impossibility. And today what uh, we can take from modern mathematics is one of the insights of mathematicians who've written about and who've studied infinity, that if you have an infinite set, it cannot be crossed. So just as in the theory of thermodynamics, if this world were eternal and it had no beginning, then everything would be the same. There would be no multiplicity. There would be no pot. There would be no table. There would be no stars. It would all be the same uniform type of matter. All energy, all heat, everything in it um, dispersed. Okay? But also, um, if there were an infinite set of finite causes in the past, you would not be able to reach the present. You cannot, cre you cannot cross an infinite set. So the fact that we are here at the present moment and that we live in this world of incredible multiplicity and great beauty and the fact that these things are all changing and they are all capable, capable of change, this is a qat'i, conclusive proof to the sound intellect that the world is temporal. Okay, so um, this is where we want to stop tonight, inshallah. And uh, we'll look also at the second part of the, the verse, وَخَصَّنَا بِخَيْرِ مَنْ لَهُ um, You know, we will talk about the prophets later. Here, as we said before, the verse is simply introducing the belief in messengers and prophets and the fact that they all have preeminence. They are all the best of human beings and that our Prophet ﷺ is the best of them. So, inshallah, we stop with that tonight. Okay, so this is a very good question. You know, that um, this sister is saying that, uh, you know, the world we define as everything other than God. And then she says that also the world is that which we can touch and we can taste and we can smell and we can see and that we can hear. She, so she said, my question is about the spirit, about the ruh, and is it also part of the world? And, um, you know, this is a very good question. Um, the ruh is also created. Uh, the spiritual dimension of reality is a, a dimension of reality that, as a rule, we do not perceive by the senses. So when we talk about the world, we do not define the world as the physical world only. The physical world, which is that world that we can see, we can hear, we can touch, we can taste, we can smell, it is the world that we all share in common. And it is the world that is that alam, that we can talk about with everyone to use as a key to the belief in God. But in the world there are many things that are unseen. There are many things that are beyond access, you know, of our physical senses. And among the greatest of these is the ruh, the spirit. And the angels are the most common of all things that were created. The angels fill the heavens and they fill the earth. And the angels can take forms. They can take beautiful forms. But as a rule, they're not that way. 
So angels are not part of the world that we directly perceive by senses. The spirits also, the jinn, they do truly exist. All human beings believe they exist. All human beings have experience about their existence. You know, and they can also take shapes so that they can be perceived by the eyes or the ears. But as a rule, they're not that way. But all of these things that are created change. All of them move. All of them um, have the characteristics, therefore, of temporality. They are not uncreated. They are created. When we speak about the life of God, which is one of the substantial attributes of God, al haya one of the things that we say about it is that God's life is not ruhiya. God does not live by virtue of a spirit, but you live by virtue of a spirit. And as the sister points out here, you know, that the body exists because of the fact that it has in it the spirit. And the body without the spirit does not live and the spirit in this world, when it leaves the body, it also leaves this world. But all of that is part of the alam. All of that is part of the created world. Okay, okay so this question is about existence. It says, can you kindly comment on the theory of existence from things in different dimensions of time and place simultaneously? Then the creation of things uh, develops as they move from one dimension to the next. Um, so, uh, you know, in the basic, in the creed that we talk about, uh, we begin with the tangible world that is before us. The world that you and I can see and touch and taste and smell, and the world that every one of us agrees is there. Okay, and this is because our creed is based on discursive knowledge, because it is based it is based on a platform where um, we all agree on what we're talking about. So when we talk about different dimensions of reality, this is something that is beyond uh, the creed that we're studying right here. Except that one of the things that we do do, and we will go into this inshallah in greater detail, is that we make a distinction between possible being and between necessary being. Okay, this is really, really important. When we talk about other things like maratib al wujud, uh, these are not things that people are required to believe in. And they are things that can be discussed, especially today when we talk about things like modern science and quantum mechanics and a lot of the issues that are raised in the world, they can be very easy to talk about. But, um, you know, this is something that, <clears throat> you know, is, uh, you know, beyond the discourse that we're in right here that we're talking about tonight. So, it says, how do we define wujud before we were created? Did we not have a type of wujud in the knowledge of God? Um, we will talk about existence, inshallah, um, in, a, in the uh, nights ahead. This is the first attribute of God. And um, insofar as human beings are concerned, we exist by virtue of the spirit that is created in us. And we know from the revelation that human spirits um, have different lives. The Prophet said, Al Arwahu Junudun Mujannada, Famata Arafa Minha Talaf, Wamata Nakara Minha Talaf. He said that human spirits are marshaled in ranks. Those of them who recognize each other, they are compatible. And those of them who don't recognize each other are incompatible. And this hadith refers to the fact that before we came into this world, we existed in another world. 
And that is called the Alam al dar And we can also call it the spiritual world. We can call it by different things. But all of us had an existence there. And that existence is an extremely important part of our identity and of who we are in this world. We then come into this world, we are born into this world, we are given these physical bodies, and we are here to be tested. And we are here to be judged on the basis of what we did, did in this world, and then we go after this into another world. And that world, the third world, we refer to as the Barzakh. The Barzakh is the intermediate world that is between this world and the resurrection. And the Barzakh is absolutely real. The Barzakh is a great world. And in fact, the pains and pleasures and realities of the Barzakh are more real than the things of this world. Okay, so this is a belief. And then we have after that the fourth life. And the fourth life is the life of an Nashar, al Hashar, al Mawqif. Al-Hisab, it is the world of the resurrection where we are given new bodies and the soul is put, in, put there again and we are brought forward to be judged and we are judged on the basis of what we did in this life. And that world is a very long time. For the disbeliever it's like 50,000 years. For the believer it's shorter, it's like the time between Dhuhr and Asr. But it is a real life. And it is different from the Barzakh. And then after that we have the fifth life of human beings and that is the Jannah and the Naar. That is the, the, the garden and the fire. These are things that inshallah we will talk about later on in the poem, bi Ithnilahi Ta'ala. Uh, they are sound, standard Islamic beliefs. So you have a history. And you have a history before this world. Um, did you have an existence in the knowledge of God? You know, this is another issue that we can talk about later when we talk about knowledge and we talk about will and we talk about power. We won't go into that tonight, but uh, there's no need to talk about that because the real issue that is being referred to here is the fact that you have these five different lives of human beings. The world before this one, this world, the barzakh, the resurrection, and then uh, the garden and the fire. So, when you talk about ancient Egyptian, to which language are you referring? Um, I'm talking about uh, the old Egyptian, which is the language of the pharaohs, and um, you know, um, it was a very stable language, you know, for thousands of years. It's well studied. It's the language that you have in the hieroglyphics. And uh, a lot of you know probably much more about that than I do. Um, um, and it, is an, it belongs to the same family as Arabic. Uh, Coptic is a derivation of that. Cop and in fact, one of the reasons why we know Pharaonic is because we study Coptic. By studying Coptic you can figure out often what the ancient Egyptian meant. Can we use providence? I have always felt a cognition in meaning uh, within the name al razab So is it usable for us? We'll talk about providence. This is one of the things that we discuss about the divine, the destiny and providence, the divine decree. Inshallah we'll discuss that in the nights ahead. Hmm. What is the difference in terminology between Al-Alam and Al-Alamin? Uh, what I've known about the latter, Al-Alamin, is that it is a collective term for everything other than God. Um, when we talk about Al-Alam as, as everything other than God, then we're referring to Al-Alamun also. And Al-Alamun, the worlds of which God is Rabbul Alamin, uh, this refers to the fact that there are different types of worlds in the world. There is the world of the angels, the world of the jinn, the world of human beings, the world of plants, the world of animals, and, and, and so forth. God 
creates whatever he wills, as he wants, as he wills, and he makes those into distinctive types and forms. Okay, but when we talk about al-alam, in the absolute, the world, then it includes all of that. And it is all, everything other than God. If the Bible is not a reliable source, what's the proof that the Qur'an is reliable and the Qur'an is based on the Bible? Okay, the Qur'an is not based on the Bible at all. Uh, The Qur'an addresses the prophetic tradition. The Qur'an addresses, if you will, the biblical tradition. The Bible, which is a book that we respect, and we must be very polite when we speak about it. And I hope that nothing that I said tonight uh, was not that way. But the Bible represents an extremely small portion of the prophetic legacy. And um, if, for example, we were to talk about Islam as just the Qur'an, without hadith, you know, without tafsir, without the knowledge of the Arabic language and so forth, that would be somewhat like speaking of Judaism and Christianity simply in biblical terms. The prophetic legacy that was given to the children of Israel was huge. And um, it includes things which are biblical and extra-biblical. And in the history of the Bible, and the best studies of the Bible have been done by Jews and Christians themselves, in the best studies of the Bible, you always have um, a vast amount of material that is outside the biblical tradition. And um, um, when the Qur'an speaks to the children of Israel, it often says things that you'll never find in the Bible. You know, for example, in the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah, the first address that Allah gives to the Jews is about what? The story of Adam, the creation of Adam. وَعَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَاءَ كُلَّهَا And then he tells us about the angels being commanded to prostrate themselves to Adam. Did you ever find that story in the Bible? In the Bible, God taught Adam the names of all things. But that's about it. And yet, among the children of Israel and among the rabbinical Jews to this day, the most important belief and the first belief is the belief about what they call Adam Kadmun, which is Adam in the Jannah. Adam before this world. And the rabbis have the whole story. They have the story with as much detail as we have it about how God created Adam, how he taught Adam the names of all things, how he enjoined the angels to prostrate themselves to Adam, how how, how Satan did not prostrate himself. You know, this is a fundamental prophetic belief in the children of Israel. And yet you won't find it in the Bible. But you will find it in other sources. Um... You know, uh, وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ وَمَا صَلَبُوهُ وَلَكِنْ شُبِّهَ لَهُمْ So God says of uh, the children of Israel that they did not kill the Messiah and they did not crucify the Messiah, but it was made so to appear to them. And where did you find that in the Bible? If you find, if you look at the New Testament that the Copts have today, or that the Orthodox have, or the Catholics or the Protestants. All of those are crucifixion texts. All of those are predicated on the belief that Jesus Christ was crucified, died, and was resurrected from the dead. Even though their texts are very interesting to work with, because they're not conclusive, especially the Gospels. Okay, but when we go to the greater tradition, which is not there in the Bible, then we find that in early Christianity, in the first century and the second century, most Christians were docetics. D-O-C-E-T-I-C, docetics, which is from the Greek word dokein. 
And dokein in Greek means shubbiha. They believed that Jesus Christ was not crucified. And they believed that someone else was crucified in his place and that the person crucified in his place was made to look like him. This was a very common belief in the first and second centuries of Christianity. And um, after later on, when the crucifixion Christianity dominates, it will wipe that out. It will clean the slate. This is the history of Judaism and Christianity. That Judaism and Christianity are never tolerant of differences in their own ranks. Muslims are historically an amazingly tolerant people. That we have differences of opinion, we have sectarian divisions, but we don't usually wipe the slate clear. That if you want to know what this particular group like the Khawarij believe, you know, you can find it very well spelled out. Okay? This is the way our history is. In Christianity, it's not that way. In Christianity, when one particular interpretation wins the day, it will wipe the slate clean to the extent that it's able to do it, and the Jews are the same way. The Jews of today are the descendants of the Pharisees. The Pharisees were a particular sect of Jews in the days of Jesus Christ. And the Pharisees, in traditional Pharisaic belief, it is kufr to look into the books, to open the books of a non-Pharisee. So you have others, you have Essenes, you have Sadukis, Sadducees, and other, you're not allowed to read their books. In Egypt you have one of the greatest, one of the most interesting Hebrews of all, who was Philo of Alexandria. Philo of Alexandria. This is a really amazing person. And his theology uh, is not Pharisaic at all. It is probably Sadducee. It is Saduki. The Jews damned Philo. And you're not allowed to read Philo. The Christians preserved Philo because of the fact that they could use his interpretation for their own theology. Okay, so this is something to know. Now, in the history of Christianity, we have also the non-canonical scriptures, which are quite extensive. Okay? And in the non-canonical scriptures, you'll find, if you look at what are called the Acts of the Apostles, in the Bible today, we have one book that is called Acts, which is a really interesting book. Okay, but you have many acts of the disciples of Christ that are not in the Bible. Every one of those is docetic, except for one. Every one of them is docetic. In the Acts of John, for example, it says that John, who was very close to Jesus, he went up on the Mount of Olives, and he was there, and he was looking at the crucifixion, and he was weeping. And then Jesus came to him to console him. And he said that I am the Messiah, and the one crucified was not me, and so forth. So, you know, this is so the, the Quran, and I think this is really important that the Quran addresses Beni Israel and it tells them about all of the things that they disagreed on. And the things that they disagreed on are the foundations of Pharisaic Judaism, uh, Trinitarian Christianity, and everything else. So the Qur'an is really amazing. May Allah enable us to get knowledge and to use that knowledge well. But we know that the Qur'an is authentic because of the way that it has been transmitted to us. And the Qur'an was very carefully transmitted. We have uh, the recitations of it. Uh, we have uh, the different manuscripts of it. And um, as a rule, you know, uh, even honest non-Muslims who are historically honest, you know, they will acknowledge that this book is the book that was given to the Prophet Muhammad or the book that he taught. So these are historical things that are based on the study of evidence. The Bible, again, you know, we respect the Bible. And, and the Bible is not easy to talk about. You know, the Hebrew Bible 
the Hebrew Bible was never pointed. You know, so for example, you know, in the Quran, as you know, you have a point under the ba, you have, um, you know, a kasra under the ba. You know, you, you know that the scene is sakina. Okay, the Bible was never pointed. And the Bible was written as letters, written together with no separation. You just have nothing but letters, no chapter, no verse. And the Gospels were written that way too. Even the Greek Gospels, they were written as Greek letters together with no punctuation, no division. So how do you read it? Where does the word begin? Where does the word end? And that's why also among the Jews are those who يَتْلُونَهُ حَقَّ تِلَاوَتِهِ Among the Jews there were those who recite the book the way that it should truthfully be recited. And they had that by idhan, they had that by ijaza. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, one of the things that the Dead Sea Scrolls community insists upon is that they have حَقُّ tilawa, That they have imams who know how to recite the Bible. So the way that the Bible is written in Hebrew today, you know, which is pointed and you have different verses, this is not older than um, 800 years. This is a rabbinic recitation that goes back to the Middle Ages. And this is why even when we talk about what the Bible is saying, you have to be very careful. Because uh, in reality, to be able to make any statement about it, you need to be able to look at the original Hebrew text. Okay, um, and, and then you see maybe the words are different. Maybe it has a completely different meaning. But um, in the Dead Sea Scrolls community, the Dead Sea Scrolls community believed that the Bible that was given to Moses was much vaster than the Bible that exists today. Uh, the Psalm of David, Psalms of David in the Bible today are 150 psalms. And the Dead Sea Scrolls community says that they were more than 4,000. That David, who was a prophet, they say that explicitly, was given over 4,000 psalms. So that means that the 150, 50% of which historians disagree about, that they represent only a small percentage of what was there. This is part of the wisdom of God sending prophets. And our Prophet وسلم, comes into history with a strong community behind him, a victorious community, and then his message is carefully transmitted and carefully preserved. And we don't say that out of irrationality or out of fanaticism. It's a historical fact. And it is one of the wisdoms of God in creation. Um, Okay, so what is the one disputed topic in Arabic? Okay, now, what were we talking about here? We're talking about the fact that Arabic is an ancient, ancient language. Okay, and then I was saying that there's only one aspect that Arabic might not have, which is believed to be um, a characteristic, characteristic of ancient, ancient Semitic, and that is a particular type of S which is sort of like a, a, it's not a sod, it's not a scene, but you have it in Thamudic. And Thamudic, by the way, the language of Thamud, is a language that was written, and you can find it on the rocks of Arabia to this day. Very, very interesting. And these are the kind of things that we have to study, you know, because Thamudic is an ancient language, and it is an ancient form of Semitic. So that would be the disputed issue. But everything else Arabic has. What is the name of Schmidt's book? Um, it's called uh, Ursprung der, is it Der Idee? Der Idee Gottes? Something like that. It's the origin of the idea of God. And it's in German. And it's also in difficult German. And um, in fact, they had conferences in the German-speaking world in Switzerland and Austria and Germany about Schmidt's book, like how can we enable people to read this book? You know, because of the fact it's very long and his German is sometimes difficult. Um, but um, they're saying that we should simplify it, we should try to get it in English. 
I think that you could probably find certain synopsises of it in English. Uh, and his name is S-C-H-M-I-D-T. Schmidt Wilhelm. William Smith. Um, Okay, so how does one reconcile between Kun Fayakun and Allah created the world in six days? Um, you know, God creates from nothing, and God creates as He wills, and God creates in different stages as He wills. So <clears throat> the issue of the six days, you know, which is not usually very problematic for us, it's often very problematic for some Christians, you know, this is about the stages of creation. But it's all creation from nothing, and creation by divine will. So how do you know what kind of aqidah to follow? In fiqh you pick from the four madhabs. Do you pick one aqidah? Can you mix and match? Okay, so that's a very good question. And um, in the tradition of Ahlus sunnah wa jama'ah, um, it was believed that, uh, you know, that we have three dimensions of Islam. And this is based on the prophetic hadith, which is known as the hadith of Gabriel, hadith Jibreel, which I'm sure all of you know. Hadith Jibreel is an absolutely authentic hadith, and it uh, has different transmissions. But in the hadith of Jibreel, um, Gabriel comes to the Sahaba, in the presence of the Prophet وسلم, and Jibreel asks, uh, what is Islam? And you all know that hadith. This is a beautiful hadith. And then, what is Iman? And what is Ihsan? This is the transmission of Abdullah ibn Umar and also of Umar ibn al-Khattab. There's also a transmission of Abu Huraira, in which it's a little bit different. In the transmission of Abu Huraira, which is in Al-Bukhari, uh, he asks first about what is Iman, and then what is Islam, and then what is Ihsan. So uh, the belief of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah is that the deen has three dimensions. You have the dimension of Islam, which is outer obedience to God. And the science of that is fiqh. Fiqh, which is understanding. That how do we understand this? How do we apply this wisely? And uh, we believe traditionally that there are four great imams of fiqh. And they are Abu Hanifa, Malik, al-Shafi'i, and Ahmad ibn Hanbal. And traditional Sunnis believe that all of them have Buddha. All of them are rightly guided and that any of them is sufficient for you if you follow him. Um, today we have many Muslims who don't understand that or who don't agree with that. And that's a very serious point. But one of the realities of Islam is the fact that Allah in his wisdom, he gave us a deen that has muhkamat. It has in it matters that are absolutely clear. They are qat'iyat. These are ummul kitab. They are the foundation of the revelation. And all of us agree on that. And then you have mutashabihat. And you also have things that are dhaniyat. You have things that are open to interpretation. Most matters of fiqh are open to interpretation. They require interpretation. They are not qat'i. And usul al-fiqh, which is one of our great sciences, goes into that. What is qat'i? What is dhanni? How do we make that distinction? So every Sunni school is a madhab, it is a methodology. You may say, but Abu Hanifa doesn't follow hadith. Abu Hanifa does follow hadith. But he does it in a particular methodology. He has a particular methodology for that. He has ta'amimul adillah. He has other things. And he's brilliant. Abu Hanifa is absolutely brilliant. We have to respect him. We have to understand him. If you follow Abu Hanifa, you will be all right. Bi'ithni ta'ala. Imam Malik has a different, different methodology. 
And for example, uh, Imam Ahmed has a different methodology. Imam al-Shafi'i has a different methodology. Even the different sources. So for example, uh, all except the Qur'an, but um, what about the Mursal Hadith? What about the Hadith that is not connected? In which, for example, Imam Malik transmits to me from Muhammad ibn al-Baqir that Imam Ali said such and such about the pilgrimage in the Muatta. Okay, is that a valid hadith or not? Some scholars will say, no, it's not, because it's not musnad. Imam Malik will say, no, it is valid because I am the mursil. I know how I got this hadith. And so whatever I left out, you can be sure that it's valid. So in the Maliki school, the Hanafi school, the Hanbali school, the mursil hadith is a hujjah. As long as we know who is the one who is giving it to us and we know that that person only took from reliable people. And then also you have Qawl al-Sahabi and you have Athar al-Sahaba. You have the post-prophetic reports. Do they constitute Sunnah or not? And some would say, no, absolutely not. Imam Abu Hanif would say, yes. Imam Malik would say, yes. Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal would say, yes. Okay, but according to certain rules. And then you have also Amal. You have the early practice of the community which is an important thing in Hanafi fiqh of Abu Hanifa and especially in Maliki fiqh. That the Prophet established Islam in Medina and it was given there to the Sahaba and to the Tabi'i and then they give it to the generation of Imam Malik. There's only two generations between Malik and between the Prophet. So was this transmitted carefully? Was it not? Some people say, no, we don't accept that. And you don't have to accept that. But the Malik will say, no, we do accept that. And we accept it according to the ulama from whom Imam Malik said, who tell us what was the established practice of Medina. And was it transmissional? Was it uh, ijtihadi? Okay, these are really important questions. So the four Imams are among many Imams. Sufyan al-Thawri, uh, al-Awza'i, al-Layth ibn Sa'ad, who was here in Egypt, who was a great faqih, you have many, but the Imams who have schools that will continue, these are the four. And in traditional Sunni fiqh, you have to respect that. And uh, this is an important question, and we have to touch this very carefully. We don't want to disrespect anyone, and we don't want to have trouble. But we need to be able to discuss, and we need to, to be able to learn. And it's very important to understand how these Imams understood the deen. They were not simple people. They were, not, they were people who had profound understanding. In the Iman, we also have different schools. So we have one approach which is essentially Athari. And this is that we will follow the Athar of the Prophet وسلم, the Hadith of the Prophet, and the verses of the Qur'an, and we will avoid interpretation. Okay, so when we have verses that talk about Ar-Rahman ala al-Arsh istawa we just accept that like it is, but we don't interpret. We don't say that God is a body who's on a throne and the throne is bigger than God. As Imam Malik said when the man came to ask him about Ar-Rahman ala al-Arsh istawa he said that uh, Al-Istiwa'u ghayru majhur wal kayfu ghayru ma'qur Okay, so it's, it's bila kayf. In other words, we accept these things, but the mutashabiha, we do not interpret. And this is a very sound school. This is a very sound belief. And then we have also the school of Imam al-Ash'ari. Imam al-Ash'ari, um, he interprets the aqidah in a way that is according to the Qur'an and the Sunnah to protect it from different uh, sects and different philosophies that had occurred in his time. Okay, so this is also a valid Imam and he has a rich tradition, a very brilliant tradition. And you also have Imam al Maturidi. Al Imam al Maturidi is, also has a profound methodology uh, for understanding these things. So traditionally we say you should follow one of these three approaches and respect them all. Respect them all. And then you have also Ihsan. And Ihsan is the way of moral perfection. And that also needs Imams. And the Imam there 
is Al-Junaid Al-Salik, Al-Baghdadi, who puts down the rules of Ihsan and uh, you know, the, the science of that. So the deen is all of these things. And that's why we always want to seek what is authentic. We want to think, seek what is authentic in belief, what is authentic in practice, and also what is authentic in the path. Um, can we stop and eat now? <laughs> can we do that? Because it's you know, very nice smell, right? And <laughs> inshallah, uh, you're probably all as hungry as I am. And inshallah, thank you so much for coming. Um, I hope that Allah will bless these evenings that we have together. I hope that we will be able to get true knowledge. May Allah forgive me for any mistakes that I make and any, uh, anything that I do that is not uh, what you deserve. And may He make these encounters really beneficial. Allahumma wafiqna lima tuhibbuhu wa tarda wa ja'alna min abidika su'ada wa amitna ala kalimatil huda allimna ma yanfa'na wa wafiqna lil amali lima allamtana bih wa ja'alna nahnu fihi khalisan mukhlisan li wajhika al kareem ya rabbil alameen Allahumma ja'al tajamma'una hadha tajamma'un marhuman wa tafarruquna ba'duhu tafarruquan ma'asuman la shaqiyan minna wa la mahruman ameen 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 والسلام عليكم